cover the disease. Please, you can start, ma. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, uh, my chiefs. Uh, this is my topic. So, uh, Dr. without... Uh, ma? Please, can you put it on slideshow? Okay, Thank I you. will. I will. Um, so, I was going to say, I will be taking this in two parts. Um, it's quite bulky, and I didn't think I was going to do all, but I didn't think it would make sense to cram it all, and we didn't benefit from it. So I will start with um, an introduction. Okay, can you see this? Yes, ma. Thank you. Okay. Fine. So we will go through an introduction with a bit of how it develops and what the mitral valve does. Then we'll take mitral stenosis today. Um, we'll take mitral regurgitation, mitral valve prolapse, and I'll take a bit of the congenital abnormalities. So what is the mitral valve? Why the name mitral? Okay. The name mitral was named because it resembled the heart of a bishop called mitre. So if we look at the two kind of parts of the heart, I don't know if it's very visible or my cursor is, there's uh, like two leaflets with a space in between. So it develops very early on in utero. We know that the heart used to be a common channel and then it twists on itself and then we start to have invaginations and whatnot. Um, so endocard, initially there was a single AV canal which endocardial cushions develop and move towards each other while they're making an invagination. So we now have the left and right with subsequent um, further development of the endocardial cushions to give. So these are the endocardial cushions. I hope you can see my cursor with um, invagination and resorption of its attachment to the wall with formation of the leaflets and then the papillary muscles and the cordy tendine. So we are looking at the first column, that's the AV, um, the atrioventricular valves. We're not concerned about the lower semilunar valves, which do not have um, papillary, papillary muscles or cordy tendine. So what does the mitral valve look like? This is, I think, what they call the surgeon's view also, if I'm not mistaken. It consists of a mitral valve apparatus, okay, which we have the anterior leaflet, note its shape then the posterior leaflet, all of which are kind of encased within the mitral valve annulus, okay? This fibrous tissue that kind of holds it together. The anterior mitral valve, the part of the annulus over the anterior mitral valve is kind of continuous with the um, skeletal, cytos, uh, skeletal structure of the heart. And the anterior mitral valve leaflet is related to the position of the aortic valve. Then there's the space, of course, where they open and when they close, we have the coaptation line right here and we have the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. Okay. Um, although this is the mitral valve apparatus, I will show the, the chordate and and papillary muscles in the second slide. Although this is the mitral valve apparatus, but its function also kind of um, depends on the left atrium and left ventricle, their compliance if there's dilatation and, and all of that. So when we come to take mitral regurgitation, we can see that we can have secondary mitral regurgitation just because of dilation of the left ventricle with an intact normal mitral valve leaflets. So this is a long mm -hmm. axis section. We have the papillary muscles. We have the anterolateral and the posterior medial. Uh, with the chordate and today attaching to their apices and then attaching to the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. Um, again, when for further characterization, remember the anterior was this kind of, I think there's a mic on, if the person could mute themselves, please. Thank you. So um, for, so we saw the structure of the anterior and it's, it's divided into kind of three parts, the A1, A2 in the middle and the A3 with the aorta behind us for reference, then the posterior mitral valve leaflet has P1, P2, and P3. These are also used when characterizing for surgery, if there's going to be repair and everything like that. So, okay. 
my slides are not moving. When I stopped, uh, I looked at participants to see if I could mute, and uh, the slides are not moving. Okay, so I will unshare and reshare, please. Just give me a second. Okay, so um, so we know that it's located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And when it's functioning normally, during systole, there's contraction of the papillary muscles with tension of the body and closure of the valve, the so-called coaptation. And we have a coaptation line, which I showed earlier. Now, the blood supply of the papillary muscles is important because when there's an infarction, it affects you know which one gets injured and what so we have two papillary muscles the anterolateral which is supplied by the left anterior descended and branches of the left circumflex so either the diagonal or marginal branches then the posterior medial has a single blood supply it's supplied by either the right coronary or the left circumflex depending on dominance hence it will be more prone to injury or infarction when there's an mi in that arterial territory, as opposed to the anterior lateral, which has dual um, dual supply. So this is just representing that. And um, yeah, so the, this is, so the, 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 the papillae is not like the anterior medial um, is dedicated to the anterior leaflet and the posterior, sorry, anterior lateral is dedicated to the anterior leaflet and the posterior medial to the posterior leaflet, but rather they share kind of the parts of the anterior and posterior leaflets that are close to them as is shown in this um, schematic diagram. So we will start with mitral stenosis. I will try to take my time to explain as much as I can um, because it's one of those, do I call it uh, cardiac conditions that, you know, there are specific signs and whatnot, and it's easy to play around with them and confuse one in either MCQs or something of the sort. Then I have also tried to refer to the latest ESC and ACCAHA guidelines. Um, since I think the aim of these presentations is because we have really short time, just a few weeks of the exam, when we take the topic, we kind of shouldn't have to go about looking for additional material to read around those topics. So I've tried to put in some details. So we will go through this. So mitral stenosis occurs when there's an abnormal narrowing of the orifice of the mitral valve, right? Oftentimes there's associated thickening of the leaflets and or even the um, subvalvular apparatus or the annulus. Now it's more less common than mitral regurgitation, but then it could frequently coexist with mitral regurgitation. Um, most cases. Okay, so we'd have another mic on, please. Okay. Oh, and my slide will not move if I try to look at participants. Okay, so most cases are due to rheumatic heart disease. For this reason, its incidence is kind of decreased in developed countries, but we still have quite a huge uh, burden. Um, but in developed countries now, in the elderly, we see mitral annul annular calcification. But still worldwide, the most um, prevalent cause of mitral stenosis is rheumatic heart disease. In general, both the rheumatic and degenerative tend to be more common in females. And there's usually a long asymptomatic period, but the onset of symptoms, just like when we the person presenting the aortic comes to do so, where the onset of symptoms heralds um, reduction in survival. So 10-year survival rate after onset of significantly limited symptoms is just like less than, this is supposed to be 15%, 10 to 15%. So... Sorry, whenever I, uh, I, I, get, I hear background noise and I try to look at list of participants to mute someone then the slides stop moving please don't don't look at them again yes i'll stop i'll stop doing that yeah i'll stop doing that it's yeah. a reflex i understand so yeah so the etiology 
this is not a typographical error. I wrote rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic heart four times because 70 to 80 percent of the burden is or even more depending on where one is is due to rheumatic heart disease um then others okay so mitral annular calcification which is a degenerative change so if the mitral annulus calcifies it could extend to the leaflets and it's seen in the elderly in developed countries frequently even coexisting with aortic or other like degenerative uh, changes so, but other less common, much less common causes include like if the person has had surgery on the mitral valve for let's say MR or some other, then it they now develop stenosis or if they have had transcatheter edge to edge, edge to edge repair, they could also have stenosis. Um, other rare causes, it could be congenital. We could have a really large vegetation from infective endocarditis. And this would typically give both MR and MS or we could have healed endocarditis with kind of a distorted valve leaflet. Um, we could also have other LA masses that could be really big and impinge on the orifice like myxoma or thrombus. But I, like I've said, these are really much less common. We could have valvulitis with um, SLE or rheumatoid arthritis, infiltrative diseases like mucopolysaccharidosis or parachute mitral valve, which is also congenital or carcinoid. So in a normal heart, we know that the mitral valve opens in diastole and blood freely flows from left atrium to left ventricle, such that there's hardly any significant pressure gradient between the two at this time. But when the orifice starts to narrow, especially when it gets below two centimeters squared, um, there's impediment to blood flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle in diastole, and then there's subsequent development of a pressure gradient, which continues to increase as the mitral valve orifice decreases. So clinically relevant MS usually starts at less than or equals to 1.5 centimeters squared. So let's, so what does that lead to if you have narrowed mitral valve orifice? So what if the pressure rises? So on a normal mitral valve, we have free flow, no pressure gradient, nothing. When it, when it um, narrows, we have increased pressure, we have increased volume, and the left atrium starts to dilate. We have turbulent blood flow. Um, the dilated left atrium can lead to increased risk of atrial arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation, which might even uh, portend the onset of symptoms. Then the left atrial pressure that increases is translated back to the pulmonary venous pressure, can cause pulmonary edema. Then, um, then in the long term, that increased pulmonary pressure can give rise to pulmonary hypertension, which can give rise to right ventricular hypertrophy um, and right ventricular failure with um, significant tricuspid regurgitation. Now, uh, in, in, in mitral stenosis, Pulmonary hypertension is a common complication, and it's usually, so we did pulmonary hypertension a few days ago, and it's usually combined pre- and post-capillary. So pre-capillary from this back flow and back pressure, but over time, because of the chronic pressure, the pulmonary arteries start to undergo remodeling that the, we have kind of a post-capillary. So it's, it's, it's a combined um, pulmonary hypertension. This is a very extensive um, pathophysiology look linking all the way to development of symptoms and signs. But we won't go through all of it, but um, so with the increased pressure, a large left atrium, we could have atrial fibrillation, which we know. Atrial fibrillation will lead to loss of that atrial kick for the remaining 20 to 30% of blood in the left ventricle, which will impair LV filling and might precipitate heart failure. Uh, we could also have compression of surrounding structures, so like Ottner's syndrome, where we have hoarseness. We could also have very high LA pressure with pulmonary congestion leading to dyspnea. Uh, we could also have hemoptysis. It's not here and some of the others. So you can look at this um, at your leisure time. Now, I will take some time explaining the hemodynamics a bit. On the left-hand side, we have a normal um hemodynamic flow uh, pressure tracing with the ECG as a reference. So we know that 
in diastole, the, 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 the mitral valve is open and we have free flow of blood. The red line is the left atrium. The black line here is the left ventricle. The pressures are almost the same, okay? Then when the mitral valve closes, we have development of systole where the left ventricle contracts and the, of course pressure will be way higher than in the left atrium. So when the mitral valve closes, the pressure gradient like drops and you have the left atrium and left ventricular pressures being almost the same. Of course, the S1, the first heart sound would be at this closure and the second heart sound would be at the closure of the AV valves. Now on the right hand side, we have pressure tracing with left ventricle and left atrium. Some of the details have been removed. So the red line here is still the left atrium and the black line is the left ventricle. So we see that, um, so let me use the cycle. What during, this is diastole, uh, systole, right? This is diastole. So when at the beginning of diastole, the left atrial pressure that is supposed to be almost the same as the left ventricle as we have on the left hand side, there's a persist, there's an increase in LA pressure over and beyond that of the left ventricle with this blue shaded area being the pressure gradient, okay? We also have a prominent A wave, more prominent than in the normal tracing because the left atrium is trying to push through that very tight, narrow valve. Um, then there's blunting of the uh, X descent right here. So, uh, these are the sounds. I will explain them better later. The sounds that we hear because of all of these uh, hemodynamic changes. So how do they present? Presentation is variable. Like we said, some of them may be asymptomatic in the beginning. Okay. And symptoms generally reflect the degree of narrowing to a large extent. Um, patients with more severe narrowing will have more severe symptoms and the more uh, the earlier symptoms develop, then the less survival. Uh, patients with my disease can be only mildly symptomatic, but in general, whenever symptoms develop is due to this um, increased LA pressure with increased LA volume overload with back pressure to the pulmonary or LA enlargement with all its consequent so stasis with thrombus formation and um, atrial fibrillation, which also worsens everything. Uh, so early symptoms are usually dyspnea, which is absent at rest, but occurs on exertion due to the increased heart rate and increased venous return. Um, and increase, yeah, increased venous return and increased LA pressure with um, exercise or exertion. And the increased heart rate reduces diastolic filling time. So the blood that had to take time to push through the left atrium into the left ventricle now has little time. So you have a little of the blood going in. Then other factors that can increase heart rate or increase venous return will also precipitate dyspnea. So we have fever or anemia or hypothyroidism or when they get pregnant. Pregnant is a pregnancy is a common on mass, let's call it, it on mass underlying rheumatic heart disease, um, emotional stress, and even intercourse. Uh, notably, tachyarrhythmias like atrial fibrillation will also precipitate symptoms. And many a time, the development of atrial fibrillation leads to um, development of symptoms or worsening of symptoms in those who were initially mildly asymptomatic and leads them to present to the hospital. So with more severe disease, we could have dyspnea at rest, with orthopnea, PND, and all of that. With the long-standing pulmonary hypertension, we start to have uh, features of right ventricular failure. Um, failure. We have ascites, you know, um, peripheral, age, whatnot. So the severely enlarged left term, like we find that uh, very busy pathophysiology flow chart will lead to compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve and give hoarseness. This is called the Ortner syndrome. It could even compress on the esophagus and give dysphagia. We could have hemoptysis due to um, elevated pulmonary vessels and rupture of um, pulmonary veins. Then we could have symptoms related to the application. So atrial fibrillation patients may come with palpitations, fatigue and whatnot. Um, thromboembolism, they could come with a stroke. And that may be the first presentation or less commonly renal artery occlusion or peripheral um, arteries. 
uh, or they could come with infective endocarditis with fever and all of that. So when we examine them, we find that in, I mean, in light skinned people, right? <laughs> Not us. They might have a malar flush from, from congestion. Uh, sometimes they have a stenosis if, if the stenosis is really bad. Uh, pulse can be low volume because remember that the not all the blood is getting into the left ventricle therefore not all of it is being pumped out and by the time you have things that reduce the diastolic thing time like atrial fibrillation or even a really narrow orifice then it means the eventually the cardiac output is kind of lower than it should be um they could have raised JVP with prominent A wave. Remember on the hemodynamics go to the A wave if they're in sinus rhythm. If they're not in sinus rhythm, we have we find irregular pulse. And they have left parasternal heave from the left atrial enlargement or much, much later from the right ventricular hypertrophy. Now the auscultation. The auscultation, there's a number of sounds that are possible. We could have a loud S1. So first heart sound is loud due to thickened, stiff leaflets that slam against each other at the beginning of systole. But as the grease severity increases, so if they're really calcified, then the first heart sound will sound normal or even diminished because they're so stiff that they do not even slam against each other at the beginning to close at the beginning of systole if they're too distorted. Then, um there's the opening snap in diastole because those stiff leaves when blood is flowing through them it could lead to tensing of the cordae and an opening snap because of the turbulence we now have a mid diastolic mama which is heard at the apex is described as a decrescendo low pitched or rumbling mama and it's best heard if we put the patient in the left lateral decuitous position and it gets louder with exercise. Now the duration of the mama correlates the severity of the mitral stenosis, not its intensity. Okay. And now we we're going to do a little exercise after this. Then um if the patient is in sinus rhythm, that remaining 20 to 30 percent of blood that goes through when the atrial atrium contacts, so the atrial kick leads to a pre-systolic acceleration of the diastolic mama, but this is absent in atrial fibrillation. So we could have other mamas like mitral fibrillation if they have mixed, you know, mitral valve disease. We could have a tricuspid regurgitation if they've had really bad um, pulmonary hypertension with um, RV dilatation. We could have even an atrial regurgitant mama if they have, you know, rheumatic heart disease with mitral and aortic affectation or even pulmonary regurgitation because of the um, really long standing backflow and increased pressures in the right side. Then, of course, we could have a loud second component of the pulmonary, um, sorry, pulmonary component of the second heart sound. Now, I would like to demonstrate these um, sounds that we spoke about because, like I said, they're, they're one of those things that can be played around a lot. But I will remove my screen from slideshow. Um, please, I'll advise if you could put your phone or device, whatever you're connecting with in, um, what do you call it, in a, in a landscape mode. And then you can tap twice to zoom it in. Um, so I tried this before the presentation, I hope it works. I'll remove that. And, uh... Can you find yourself in here? So I'm, I'm trying to make this interactive. Please, I hope everybody is okay thus far. Like we understand what has been done. Um. So I I might need a volunteer. I'll call Dr. Oribalade if you're around. Just be on the standby. We might work through this um, together. So if in a normal person, okay. Please, can you see? Um, 
Okay, let me try writing first. So I'm writing normal. Okay. Uh, no, that's not coming out well. So in a normal person, so let's put normal like that. Um, we usually have a first heart sound, a second heart sound, a first heart sound, a second heart sound. This is S1, this is S2, S1, S2. Of course, we know this is systole. This period is diastole. This is another systole. Can we see this, please? Yes, we are following you. Are they, Andrew? Yeah. You're following? Yeah. Okay. Fine. So in mitral stenosis, MS, okay, we have a loud S1, okay? Loud S1. Okay, with regular S2. So this is S1, S2, S1, S2. Then uh, the sounds of mitral stenosis are actually they are diastolic. So we have the opening snap developing in diastole. Then uh, because of the turbulence, we have the diastolic rumbling mama with the pre-systolic accentuation. Okay, so we have this mama with the pre-systolic accentuation right here. Are we good so far? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, just I need the feedback because I, I don't know if, you know, it's it's that clear or not. So, in severe MS now, severe, sorry, severe MS, the S loud S1 will not be there. So we will have a regular S1 or even diminished. Okay, so S1, S2, S1, S2. It will be normal. It won't be um loud like in mild to kind of moderate. And our opening snap will start close earlier in diastole. So our opening snap will be closer to the S2. These are some of the markers of severity. In severe MS, the opening snap is closer to the S2. So that's this red line. is occurring closer to the S2. Then our mama, okay, will be there for longer. So the duration of the mama will be longer. If we look at this period, it's longer than this period. Okay, we're good? Sure, we are. Okay, then in atrial fibrillation, so this severe MS guy now developed atrial fibrillation. We have our S1, our S2, our S1, and S2. Then our opening snap, because he's, he has severe, is still close to the S2. And this our, this our diastolic rumbling mama now does not have the pre-systolic accentuation. So it just keeps going down, 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 down till we have an S1, till we have another heart sound. So it loses this pre-systolic accentuation that is there in sinus rhythm. So are we good so far? The loss of pre-systolic accentuation. Can you take that again? Sorry. Okay. So I said in atrial fibrillation, Right, in a person with severe MS, we have our regular or even low, um, low. Let me use the laser pen. Okay. So, so this is this is uh, S one, right? Then we have the opening snap. Okay. Then we have our diastolic mama that goes 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 all the way to the end because that atrial kick is not there to cause the pre-systolic accentuation that we see in normal sinus rhythm. Does that make sense? Chief was okay. Well, well, well noted, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, fine, so we'll continue with the regular presentation. So I just hope that was a bit useful. <laughs>
uh, it's something that we keep reading and forgetting and i just thought okay so how how or at least i keep reading and forgetting i don't know if people have that problem it's, it's very okay now okay it's, thank you thank you so much all right thank you that, that, that's that's should be that's ten. yeah it's still there i'll leave it inside inside the slide if when i'm sharing it so when we want to do our diagnostic workup of course we will do an ecg which we will see almost all patients to the general block. sir Okay, let me carry on. I thought someone was talking. So we have left atrial enlargement in almost all patients. Of course, we don't see always in medicine, but the average MS patient that will present to the hospital because of symptoms will likely have LAE on the ECG. We could find atrial fibrillation, of course. If they've it's been long-standing with pulmonary hypertension, then we could find features of right ventricular hypertrophy, or even a right axis deviation. So on chest x-ray, we see features of left atrial enlargement, like splaying of the carina, double right heart shadow, ballet dancer sign on the lateral x-ray. We could find features of pulmonary congestion, like curly B lines and our upper lobe diversion. And if pulmonary hypertension is really severe, we could have prominent pulmonary arteries. Now, excuse this busy slide, uh, echo is first line. From here, I'll start showing guidelines. So that's, this is why I didn't want to join the two pathologies because it gets, um, it gets, the lot of guidelines make things, you know, it gets boring. So echocardiography, we have, we could see the structure of the mitral valve, right? The thickening we talked about, any calcification, diffusion of commissures, how the leaflet isn't moving as it should. We can assess the subvalvular apparatus or, um, the cordae, the papillary muscles, we should look for thrombi or thrombus in the left atrium. And the left ventricle is usually normal sized, you know, normal size, normal wall, if not even small. And if we put a Doppler, we see that flame shaped um, Doppler mitral valve signal. Now, one of the main functions of echo is to help us assess the mitral valve area. Um, which we can do by direct measurement of the valve by planimetry. And according to the ESC 2021 guideline, they say this is the reference measurement, but the transvalvular gradient and pressure half time can give additional information about the consequences of um, this MS and have a prognostic role. We could also measure by pressure half time, noting that um, it has its limitations because uh, it, it depends partly on the, so the, with varying severity of the MS, the accuracy kind of um, varies as well. Then the LA and LV compliance also influence the measurement of mitral valve area using pressure half time. So but what is this pressure half time? Pressure half time means the time it takes for the pressure of passive flow from left atrium to left ventricle. So passive flow, not the active atrial kick, right? So which is basically the E-wave um, when we do mitral valve Doppler interrogation to decrease to a half of its peak value. So if the mitral flow um, pressure, how much time it takes to decrease its peak value, because it's related, it is related to the velocity of deceleration. Uh, we remember um, our Bernoulli equation, which kind of is also relevant here. And we use it, we use continuous wave rather than the usual pulse wave that interrogation that we do of the mitral valve to make this measurement. And basically mitral valve area equals to 220 divided by the pressure half time. Therefore, the longer the pressure half time, the narrower the orifice and vice versa. So if we say 220 divided by 1.5, that's a narrow valve, it will be, um, sorry, not, Anyways, let's say 220 divided by, I don't know, 150 rather, not 1.5. It will give us a, a value. If we say 220 divided by 200, it will give us a smaller value. So the longer the pressure half time, that means the, the, the longer it takes for that blood to get through from the left atrium to the left ventricle because of the narrow orifice. Other, other, um, 
formulae that can be used, other methods that can be used to measure the mitral valve area if we have some optimal echo, include the Gorling formula, which uses cardiac health measurements. We could use a uh, continuity equation in rheumatic MS, but these two methods are usually the most widely used. Of course, we should use echo to assess for pulmonary artery systolic pressure and assess for presence of pulmonary hypertension. Now, um, so we start with the guidelines. So please don't sleep off. Um, in the ACCAHA guideline, um, TTE is first line, it has a class one recommendation. Do TTE first to establish your diagnosis, quantify hemodynamics, look for other valvular lesions. Um, then we could also do TEE in patients that are being considered for percutaneous mitral balloon commissurotomy to rule out LA thrombus to further characterize the structure of the valve. The ESC, they don't have a table for this, but from the text, it says TT is usually also sufficient to provide information for routine management, or we should do TOE, so transesophageal, to exclude LH thrombus um, after an embolic episode or when we're planning um, percutaneous uh, balloon mitral commissurotomy. And valve area should be measured using 2D planimetry according to the ESC, but uh, we should also measure transvalvular gradient and pulmonary pressures and all of that. Uh, th 3D echo could also have give additional diagnostic value. And in echo, especially for patients being my, um, planned for percutaneous balloon mitral commissurotomy, we should do scores to assess their suitability for this procedure. So one of the most widely used scores is the Wilkin score, which assesses mobility, thickness, calcification, survivular so thickening, and patients that are, and scores them one to four. So the, the highest score could be 16 and the lowest is four. And patients that have a score of less than eight are the ones that are um, suitable for this procedure, balloon commissurotomy. So other investigations, we could do stress testing, especially when we have discrepancy between uh, symptoms and echo findings. We can do it via exercise, which is the preferred because it's more physiologic, or we could use pharmacological agents. We could do it as exercise echo or stress echo, or we could do cardiac catheterization with stress for hemodynamics. So where we should, of course, measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and those tracings that we saw earlier. So we use right heart cath to do to get those tracings and demonstrate the um pressure gradient and all of that. Um, we can assess the pulmonary artery pressures on cardiac cath. And in earlier Omalda disease, they usually have them only during exercise, but later even at rest, we could also do cardiac CT. So, so doing exercise stress testing is a class one recommendation from the ACCAHA 2020 guidelines. If you have discrepancy between echo and clinical symptoms, or if you have like inadequate echo assessment. So how do we stage mitral stenosis? Um, the ESC did not stay, uh, stage, at least I, I went through, I tried to compare the two um, guidelines. So I didn't see much about anything about staging or much about staging, but in the ACCHA, which is very useful, we have stages A, B, C, and D for most of the valvular pathologies. Stage A is at risk of MS. So if we have um, any slight issue that might you know, progress to an MS, so like mild valve domain during diastole. Stage B is progressive. you know, thickening and all of that, but the mitral valve area is greater than 1.5. Hemodynamics, we see increased triastrolic pressure half time is less than 150. If we do that formula, our PHT formula, if we do 220 minus 150, you could pick your phones and do that now. You'll find that it gives you like 1.46 something, something. So about one point. So, so it will be... um. Yeah, so it's less than 150. So from 150 is kind of where severity starts to give us around 1.5. Uh, then they do not have hemodynamic consequences and they do not have symptoms. 
in stage C, asymptomatic, severe MS or asymptomatic, they don't have symptoms, but we see severe early enlargement with increased pulmonary artery systolic pressure and a mitral valve area less than or equals to 1.5. So this is severe. Less than or equals to 1.5 is the cutoff for severe, is the cutoff for when we come to the interventions and many things. So it's kind of the number to hold on to, less than 1.5 centimeters squared. Uh, and of course, the valve anatomy is distorted and all whatnot, and the MVA. So MVA, both by hemodynamics and anatomy, would be less than or equals to 1.5. Then symptomatic severe is kind of like the stage C, but they have symptoms, either exertional dyspnea, decreased exercise tolerance, and all of that. So treatment or management is multidisciplinary, and there's evidence to show that multidisciplinary approach improves patient outcomes. The ESC um, recommends using having what is called a heart team with many specialists, as opposed to the ACCHA, which calls them the heart valve team. The argument, sorry, typo. The argument for the ESC is that many of these patients with um, valvular heart disease would also have like other cardiac pathology. So you could have somebody with valvular heart disease also having coronary artery disease. So kind of the specialist should be able to manage both and take decisions that um, would help them treat the patient holistically, like address all of the cardiac issues at once. Um, they recommend having what they call heart valve centers, which are like um, referral centers, centers of excellence for valvular heart disease that have high volume, specialized training, they're able to keep registries, they're able to audit their work and help with research and whatnot. Then the heart valve clinic, which is specialized outpatient clinics for valvular heart disease, with valvular heart disease nurses and doctors that are trained for this um, um, for this task. For the ACCHA, they call them the heart valve team and comprehensive heart valve center, which is kind of like the half heart valve center and primary heart valve center, which does less than the comprehensive. So of course, non-pharmacological management would include um, healthy, maintaining a healthy diet, still um, incorporating some aerobic exit support and all of that. And when they have comorbidities, this should not be. So they should have GDMT for their other comorbidities. So you could have somebody with MS also having hypertension or dyslipidemia or heart failure or whatever, coronary artery disease. So they should receive GDMT, medical therapy for this. Should they have them so that all in all, they have a better quality of life, better survival. Like we don't just treat their valvular heart disease and they have a cholesterol, total cholesterol of eight um, and we don't bother because that could lead to other problems. Um, so basically, this is just kind of emphasizing the the multidisciplinary approach thing. For every patient, we should assess their symptom burden, their severity, what is causing the heart valve lesion, how it's affected their lifespan, what are their goals for treatment, both the managing team and the patient's goals for treatment. And these are their recommendations. I won't go through for the heart valve team. The ACCHA has a class one recommendation for the heart valve team multidisciplinary, and these are the requirements of, of what a heart valve center should have according to the ESC. So apart from cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, also cardiac imaging specialists, you know, interventional cardiologists, whatever, cardiovascular anesthetists, all of that. And they should have capacity to do like high, you know, um, specialized imaging, including CT, CMR, cardiac cath, nuclear medicine, exercise tests, and all of that. So apart from the non-pharmacological treatment, of course, medical treatment. Now for medical treatment, the only treatment with a class one recommendation in both the ACC, AHA, and ESC recent guidelines is using warfarin for atrial fibrillation or presence of LA thrombus or prior thromboembolic event in a patient with mitral stenosis. This has a class one recommendation. There's evidence to support this, um, quite convincing evidence to support this. So class one, um, okay, this is older. So this is before the Invictus and all of those, um, some of those trials. This is the um, ESC, which is more recent, 2021. So some of the trials had been published. That is why it has a 
level of evidence A compared to the ACC. So other drugs can be used to control symptom, you know, control symptoms or improve like diuretics, but they should be used cautiously. Um, then we should also control tachycardia. We could use beta blocker, non-hydrohydropyridine, calcium channel blockers, digoxin or evabradine if they are in um, sinus rhythm. Because we remember we said tachycardia dis dis reduces diastolic filling time and reduces the time that the left atrium can push blood into the left ventricle and subsequently reduces cardiac output. So that vicious cycle. Then we should do rate control as in, well, control the rate in atrial fibrillation. I left out some of the recommendations. They say do not do catheter ablation or even cardioversion a patient with MS and atrial fibrillation prior to valve intervention, okay? So if you're going to consider rhythm control using catheter ablation or pharmacologic uh, cardioversion, then do it after the valve has been intervened because um, like sinus rhythm restoration doesn't last if the valve stenosis is still there. But there's so much detail that um, I couldn't put really everything. We shouldn't use NOAX for MS with AF. And okay, I even have the I even have it here is so do not do catheter ablation or cardioversion prior to valve intervention as this does not maintain sinus rhythm. So use of NOAX is class three. So don't do. If you have AF with moderate to severe MS, do not give NOAX. Give warfarin, and um, it's much better. So, um, okay, this slide was supposed to come after, but uh, okay. So how do we treat? Okay, after medical therapy, it's um, valve intervention. What do we do? Valve intervention, we do either the percutaneous uh, mitral balloon commissurotomy or we do surgery. Now, the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy is the recommended treatment in symptomatic. So for the ESC, treatment starts when the valve area is less than or equals 1.5 centimeters squared. Remember, we said that's the figure to hold on to. So it's a class one recommendation. If now this English, they say patients without unfavorable. So the without and the on means favorable characteristics. So remember our Wilkins score. Um, or if you have symptomatic patients with contraindication or high risk for surgery, or if you have symptomatic patients who are not. Um, yes. So just do percutaneous balloon me unless you have a contraindication. It is the preferred first line. There are class 2A indications for other classes with um, other groups of patients, like those who want to get, um, so those who high thromboembolic risk, but if they, are asymp if they are asymptomatic, we can look at these later. So when should yeah, yeah. we not do, sir? When should we not do? If you have mitral valve area greater than 1.5 cm squared, the ESC recommends don't. If you have a thrombus, you're just going to embolize it. If the MR, if they have significant MR, you're just going to make it worse. If they have severe calcification, you will not be opening that um, valve. You just like fracture it and then you have free flowing MR. If there is no commissural fusion, then what's the point of ballooning? And if you have severe concomitant aortic or combined tricuspid, so if you have other mitral um, valvular disease that will require surgery, don't do a balloon for the mitral and then go do surgery. Like just try to probably do them all together. Then if we have coronary artery disease requiring bypass, also go and do them together, kind of. So um, yes, so. The ACCHA also has some, there's some slight differences, but the class one are pretty much the same. You have symptomatic patient with severe, that's less than 1.5 CM squared without contraindications, okay? Without thrombus, without, um, and they have favorable valve morphology, the class two and two B we can look at later. So this is the, what percutaneous balloon mitral commissurotomy looks like. We, usually transvenous, you get a balloon, we inflate, we push it through and kind of open up the stenosed valve. Of course, we can imagine from this that one of the complications would be mitral regurgitation. So that is why patients who already have significant mitral regurgitation, you don't want to do this. Um, so this is the decision flow chart. 
for the ESC 2021 valvular disease guideline. So starting with mitral valve area less than or close to 1.5 cm squared, the patient has symptoms and they have, we assess if they have, so the first line is do PMC. If they have contraindication, we consider surgery. If they have contraindication or high risk for surgery, um, and they have some favorable anatomy, you could still come back to trying out PMC. If they have contraindication to it, we go through. Uh, so, so really the aim is to do a, a balloon commissurotomy unless we can't. Now, when patients do not have symptoms, we assess their risk for embolic or hemodynamic decompensation. If they don't have, we do exercise testing to further characterize that. If they have symptoms on exercise testing, then we consider them for balloon. If they don't have symptoms, you follow them up. The duration of follow-up kind of differs a bit between the two guidelines. I think one is annual. The other one is, is it three years or so? I'm not sure, but there's some difference. But asymptomatic patients should be followed up. And the others should be offered either per balloon, commissurotomy, as unless they have contraindications and we consider surgery. Similar here. So for the ACCHA, they still consider to some extent if you have a valve area more than 1.5. When you look at the slides and the class 2A and 2B recommendations, some of them fall here. Okay. And eventually we, we would want to do um balloon for those that have a favorable valve, no clot, and less than moderate, less, not more than mild. There's a way they say it. I think not more than mild MR or something like that. So the surgery can be, my slides got mixed up. The surgery, okay. The surgery can be valve repair or valve replacement. Valve repair is preferred, but the expertise is not available in many areas and many surgeons are not too keen on repair, but it's said to, it's, it's the preferred one, or we could, so it's surgical commissurotomy that we do. The alternative is to replace the mitral valve. Now I quoted this from the ACCAJ guideline, just to show us that the, the replacement is really the kind of the last option. So they say mitral valve replacement is an option for treatment only if there is no other option and the patient has severe limiting symptoms because um, valve replacement comes with its own you know, challenges. So, uh, okay, so bio, bio valves can be bioprosthetic, in which case patients may not need lifelong anticoagulation unless of course they have AF or they've had a previous stroke, or they can be mechanical, in which case patients would need long lifelong anticoagulation with warfarin and all of the um, challenges it comes with monitoring of INR and the fact that many of these patients are young because it's rheumatic and more are female and they might want to get pregnant and all of that. So valve replacement is the last resort if we can't do anything else. For the calcific, there isn't a lot of evidence to support surgery, but it can be considered. And evaluation is also kind of done to to um, classify severity, but it's not as well studied and the guidelines are not as well clear cut. Like it's just a really small paragraph in both the ESC and ACCAHA guidelines. So IE prophylaxis, now both ESC and AHA recommend we should take general measures like maintaining good oral hygiene, if these patients have an infection, they should be treated early. If they should go for any surgery, we should um, observe strict asepsis, but none has a class one recommendation for infective endocarditis and prophylaxis. In fact, I just took this out. We already had IE some time back, so I don't need to go through this, but the best is a class two recommendation. This is the ACCHA, and we were told, of course, to remind us that antibiotic prophylaxis is reasonable when we're doing dental procedures that involve manipulation of gingival tissue, periapical region, or perforation of oral mucosa, not for gastroenterological or urological procedures. So this one don't do. Um, and who? So prosthetic valve, in case we've done valve replacement for MS patients, or prosthetic material used for valve repair, or if they've had previous IE, unrepaired cyanotic heart disease, 
cardiac transplant. So we really don't see just rheumatic MS featuring here as being a blanket recommendation for IE. The ESC is kind of also a bit similar in this regards with some slight differences. So I've come to the end of mitral stenosis. The next part of this, which will take another day, will be mitral regurgitation, then we'll also do mitral prolapse. But I wanted to hopefully like do it well so that after this we we've been we've had like a good revision on mitral stenosis and we wouldn't need to go and do some particularly tasking again studying about it. So thank you. I welcome questions, comments. Chief Ade and Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kayat, for an excellent presentation. Thank you for taking us through the at sounds in MS and AF. Very, very explicit. Please, um, Chiefs on the platform, we need your contribution or comment in case if you have any. Comment questions. Dr. Ozuki, you have a question, right? Good evening, everybody. Network has been playing games on me. I've been locked out for at least five times since I started this discussion. Chief uh, Professor, welcome, sir. Good evening, sir. Right. Um, Chief Okopi, you're welcome, sir. Sorry, I just came in and I'm very feeling very sad that I, I was not at the beginning from the excellent presentation by my very friend and sister, Dr. Rukaya. But I, I think I enjoyed the later part. Thank you so much, Dr. Rukaya. Always excellent. Chief Okopi, thank you. Um, hello. Hello. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ruka, for that um, succinct presentation. Um, just want to reemphasize the importance of um, stress test in um, mitral stenosis. Um, because a lot of the time, especially in elderly patients, you know, uh, um, they, 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 they can sort of limit their activity to accommodate the mitral valve lesion that they have. And when they come to the hospital, they may not complain of any symptoms. So um, it's like a 65 year old man who used to go out walking every evening or play tennis, who just decide, oh, I can't tolerate that anymore. Stop playing tennis, cannot take his regular walk. But then when he comes, he will not complain of symptoms. He says he's doing his usual activities fine. He's not having any symptom. But such patients, when you put them on a, um, when you stress them, then you know that they become symptomatic. So um, the stress test become very important to pick such patients early before they become overtly symptomatic and intervene with your commissurotomy if they fit meet the criteria. So for MS, um, stress testing is very important and. Part of assessing the symptoms of the patient, you know, asking about their activities, what activity they used to do, and any limitation they are having or avoiding certain activities also help to give you a clue to find out whether they are beginning to develop symptoms. And then um, I have a question. In terms of the clinical um, um, features, um, 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 in medical school, we all used to talk about the tapping apex bit. I didn't hear you mention yeah. about that. And then I, I'll, I, I I'll, I'll like you to, <laughs> yes. Um, if you could explain the mechanism of the tapping apex bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was an oversight. I thought I had put it. So do you want to help us explain the mechanism? Chief Conte. <laughs> That's very corny yeah, of you, throat Kaya. Throat. <laughs> Sorry, my throat is really dry. I want to go and get water. So. Okay, All right. no problem. Um, um, you know, so the the the, the tapping apex beat in mitral stenosis um is a very important um, um um sign, okay, that you pick by the bedside, and um, back in medical school, some books will tell you, you know. The tapping apex bit is produced by um, 
the atrial contraction against a stenose um, a mitral valve. But um, detailed study into the, 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 the precordial pulsations in cardiology, in fact, is a whole um, 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 aspect of cardiology called ballistography. That is the study of precordial movements with um, 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 the cardiac cycle. So when they combine um, ballistographic um, studies together with phonographic studies, listening to the heart sound, you know, they've um, um, come to the agreement that the tapping apex bit of mitral stenosis is actually produced by the forceful closure of the mitral valve. Because what happens is that um, because of the high pressure in the left atrium, the mitral valves do not close early. The pressure has to rise significantly in the left ventricle for it to be able to close the mitral valve. So that forceful closure of the mitral valve is what produces the tapping apex. And one thing they've, they've noticed is that, they've observed is that the tapping apex bit, unlike the pre-systolic accentuation, it does not disappear when the patient has atrial fibrillation. And that is one of the main things that um, spoke against the explanation of the atrial contraction being responsible for the, the tapping apex. So whether you have atrial fibrillation or not, the tapping apex bit will still be there because it is actually produced by the closure, the forceful closure of the um, stiff mitral valve reflex. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what was that? Did you say ballistography or something? You could... Yeah, ballist ballistography. So there okay. is, a, is a, a procedure of, they use accelerometer to just evaluate the cordial movement with the cardiac cycle. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Siri, sorry for interjecting. We have one of our, before we call Prof, I don't know if we, if I can just raise him to call some of our chiefs. Very, very committed chief. We have Dr. Fatima Bashir, she's here. Dr. Fatima, please, can you um, make one or two comments? Dr. Fatima. Uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Prof. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, Sorry, well, Fatima, then the... are you in Morocco? <laughs> Why did you say so? This is evening. You are saying money. Wow. <laughs> I missed morning <laughs> presentations, <pa. laughs> I missed morning presentations. So let's take it as morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all that, that, that. that. <laughs> All right. Well, it's nice to be with the cardiologists again. Um, well done, Dr. Rukaya, for an excellent presentation. Um, I don't have much to say about it. Uh, actually, uh, if you are to discuss MS, you can spend the whole day discussing it, so you may not be able to touch everywhere. But I don't know if you talk about um opening SNAP. Mechanism for opening SNAP. I had Dr. Conti talk about S1 pre systolic accentuation, the opening SNAP, the diastolic rumbling murmur. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So they're all here, and we even had a live exercise of figuring out the different. Okay, okay. Yeah, when yeah. I joined, um, um, late, you have yeah. actually passed this stage. Maybe that's why. But you can, so you know, add, add consultant flair to. Ah. <laughs> okay, so the opening snap is um also uh, one of the symptoms in MS, and it's usually produced by the because of the high LA pressure with uh, mitral stenosis. So the high pressure will force open the mitral valve leaflet. So that's forceful opening of the valves will produce the opening snap, the forceful um, separation of the anterior mitral valve leaflet from the posterior because of the high LA pressure will uh, produce the opening snap. Then um, the distance between the opening snap and the S2, I think is also important in uh, 
um, grading the severity of MS. Mm -hmm. The more severe the MS, the shorter the distance between the opening snap and S2, and the less severe, the higher the um, the uh, longer the distance. Why? Because with um more severe MS, the higher the pressure, then the earlier the this uh high pressure will force open the leaflets. And the less severe, the longer this um high pressure will open the leaflets. So this is just my little addition. Thank you and well done. Thank you. Mm, Fatty by you just reminded me of the argument. I mean sorry, the uh, back and forth we had in that prof's question with MS and opening snap. <laughs> You still remember, right? Yeah. And that <laughs> uh, deliberation is actually what make the discussion interesting. It to, it's what will make you remember all this things. Yes. Yes. We, we, it was a heated argument that night, I remember. <laughs> it took almost one hour. <laughs> thank wow, we so thank much. God. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Ozoke, over to you before you call Prof. Maybe you can get another interaction from us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief Fatima. Thank you, Prof. Chikokopi. Prof, you're welcome once more. Uh, you can share your slide now. Let us, you can share, uh, share your slide now. Let's continue with the MCQ. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Oh, sorry, Prof is not around. He's around. I had called him earlier, but it appears he's not yet disposed to to speak. Okay. Okay, sir. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But his, his, his mic is on. He's speaking. Okay. Okay. Probably network. Yeah. Uh, let's just let's wait a bit because he has a lot of. I don't know. I think it's my network that's from Twitter. To me, I think you should continue. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Time. But one thing I just want to tell Chief Conti is that um, stress um, stress test is not only for asymptomatic MS. Stress test is for asymptomatic valvular heart disease. So that means if you have a stage, because if you check the way ACC um, grades um, the valvular disease, similar to all the valvular disease, okay? Either is MS or MR or whatever valve you You always see that stage or class C, which will be asymptomatic severe valvular lesion, either is a stenosis or regurgitation. It's the same form of grading. But just remember that everyone in the stage C should have a stress test done. Either it's MS or MR, AS or whatever heart condition, you understand? So it's not just limited to MS alone. The only, the, and the basic reason is we just want to induce symptoms that will classify them into stage D. But in this environment though, mm -hmm. Even though there's international guideline, you should also focus on your local experience and how you have seen your patients perform. We are of the opinion that when they're in the stage C, it's better they have early surgery because we know that the condition is not going to improve. Anybody that has an MS with valve area more than less than 1.5 and is having if you have pulmonary hypertension, that means PSP above 50, and is asymptomatic. It's just a matter of time. It will soon become symptomatic. Okay? The same thing applies for MR, AS, whatever. But what we have noticed so far is that if their ejection fraction, especially for MR, start dropping, and they are now having symptoms of heart failure, even after you change that valve, you will still continue to treat them for heart failure all their life. All their life. They will never be off at a failure regimen. So the question to us will now be, since we know that this condition will not get better, 
without the intervention, without the surgery. Why don't you do an early surgery for them so that they won't enter heart failure and they can limit the volume of medications they take? Because if you see somebody that has severe MR and has an ear for 30% and you're not sending him for surgery at that time, you already know he's already in heart failure. You already know that even if you replace the valve, that does not mean EF would improve. You already know that it needs to be on anti failure therapy. So don't let this patient have an ideology that after the surgery, then I won't need that failure medicine again. It's just deception. He's still going to need the medicine because he has entered that failure. So the best for us is if he's in the class, if he's in the stage C, where he's still asymptomatic, then he should do the surgery. Because the moment you enter the stage D and start having that failure on NYK, two, three, four, you won't get out of it even if it does the surgery. So I need you to understand our own environment. And number two is that surgery is expensive, patients is paying out of pocket. So it simply means that the earlier they start raising their money for surgery, the better for them. When you discover this severe amount, even though it's asymptomatic, Please raise money for surgery urgently so that you can buy time from them. If they are in that stage, they are in NYHA 4, then they can't go to work. They can't go and raise money. Is that when you want to not send them for surgery? And that's uh, the patient now. Well, this is now the time you need surgery. You have, they've just elapsed the opportunity. So please, let's always note that when we do patient, find patients on echo, pictures, or we see them in clinic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Sir. Please, could you stop sharing so that before we start again, so that this um, first part of the lecture will be handy to go through. You mean sharing or recording? I've stopped sharing. Recording, recording sorry, recording.